All right, we are back on the PHOI Eagles podcast, and we've got our man. Good to see you, Baldy. How you doing? Well, I'm good. I'm I'm good. You know, we're um I'm I'm like everybody else in this in our little bubble world of ours. I'm just you know just doing my work, getting ready for the draft, which seems like it's bigger than any other holiday in this whole country right now. So I'm 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 busy preparing, but I'm I'm rested. I'm I'm charged, and I'm like uh, trying to learn new things about a bunch of new players that are coming to the league. That is like, that is sort of my favorite part of the draft process is like the, the cramming for a test of it all, yeah, uh, yeah. which is like the way that I approach many things, but yeah, like there's so, you know, it's, it's three weeks left. I want to learn about as many people as I can, but I, I want to start yeah. because I, I just have a sense that this was probably not your first earthquake. So it's funny. I was uh, in a uh, production meeting getting ready for uh, this path to the draft show that we have today. And we're going through it, and I'm uh, the walls are shaking. I'm at NFL Films, and I, I hear and feel the walls shaking, and I'm like, "This is an earthquake," and I have been in them. I was in one one time at Novacare. I was talking to Juan Castillo. Uh, you might have been there, both. I was, was there. I was on camera at the time. I had to close the show. So, I, do you remember that day? Like I, I can't yeah. remember if that was the spring, if that was OTAs. Like I, I know. Like I'm talking that's right. to Juan. What was going on? And I thought, and they were doing some kind of construction in the room above the yes. studio. And I thought that that's what was happening was that the construction was about to collapse. Yeah. And I, and I, like, I, I saw this, they had this huge, I don't know what they were doing. Like, and maybe it was one of those um, camera video things that just, you know, that, that just, I don't know. I just saw the wheels on it shaking <laughs> and Juan was looking at me and I was looking at Juan. I'm like, yep, it's an earthquake Juan. I don't know how many years ago that was, Bo, but that think, was the last one I was in. Until I think it was 2011. I think I think that's okay. right. Yeah. All right, let's let's talk a little let's talk a little offensive line before we get to the draft. As the Eagles have signed uh, Jordan Mailata to an extension, give yeah. us your sense of like where you think Jordan ranks among like the the tackles in the league. Well, I mean, you could you can analyze this in a vacuum and just look at tackles, but I, I kind of look at what they did with Landon Dickerson and extending him and knowing how these two guys have really kind of grown together over the last, you know, two years and how well they play together and just what kind of friend they'll be friends for the next 50 years. But I feel like that left side is as powerful as any left side in football. Um, Jordan is, he's an elite player. That's why they extended him for the second time. Uh, very hard to get around him. You can't go through him. And if they would have leaned on the run game, more in the second half of the season, we might not have seen the collapse that we all watched uh, in you know in the last seven eight weeks of the season. I, he's he's a very good player. He got his stance, uh, you know, from from Lane. Really studied him. He's got that flying kick stance, getting out of his stance. He's very very good at that. When he gets off to a good start, he rarely ever gets beat. There there are so many interesting variables about what the offensive line is going to look like next year for the Eagles and, and really even moving forward. And so I want to get to, to all of those a little bit. But I think one of the things that's interesting about Jordan is because he started as this like total blank slate guy, you know, Stout trained him on both sides. He can do left and right. And so as you are thinking, what might the Eagles do if they want to draft a tackle in the first round to eventually replace Lane? I think they do have the optionality. If it, the guy that they draft is just a left side guy, they could eventually flip Jordan to the right side. Do you think that that's a, a part of their consideration? No, I think he's their left tackle. I, mean, okay. I don't think Lane's, Lane, Lane's going to play at least two more years, at least this year, next year. Uh, he's healthy. He feels good. Uh, you know, he's on his training program. And last year at this time, he was coming back from, you know, double hernia surgery. So, uh, you know, he's, he's in, he's in good, he's in a good place. Saw him yesterday. Um, but look, I, you, you can never go wrong, you know, drafting offensive linemen. I don't care if it's at 22 or 50 or 53. There's there's good players in this draft. Like, they lost a lot of depth this year, Bo. They lost, uh, you know, Sua Petta. They, they lost Jack Driscoll. They yep. lost Kelsey. They lost a lot of depth. And so you can draft a tackle and play him at guard. You can get value for him. Um, you could draft a guard that can double as a center, you know, a Graham Barton type. Um, you know, you, I, I've been pushing for Cooper Beebe out of Kansas state, Interesting. but you watch Christian Haynes out of Connecticut. I mean, there's, there's a lot of prospects here that, um, are, that, that could be taken with any number of those, uh, top three picks that they have. 
So just in general, before we get to some of those those potential options at 22, I have been sort of cautioning about like the, the difficulty of just assuming that this offensive line is going to be, you know, a top five group without Jason Kelsey next year. How would you sort of explain the difficulty of, of what it's going to be like to have Cam Jurgens there and all of the different variables that's going to change about pre-snap stuff and everything they can do in the running game? Well, I mean, when they drafted Cam Jurgens, they knew that Jason Kelsey was on the back end and they didn't know when he was going to retire. I mean, he'd been hinting at it for the last three years. And so I think, you know, I mean, I think he, I know he could still play, but sometimes it's good to leave the party before the lights come on. Um, but that, that was the heir apparent. I mean, he was part of the process of getting Cam Jurgens drafted. He was an excellent prospect coming out of Nebraska. Um, you know, when he has had a chance to play center, he's been fine. Like nobody, I think it's kind of ridiculous to think he could be J.C. Kelsey from all of it, from the leadership, the the ex- excellent play, you know, tracking uh, linebackers 30 yards down the field. I mean, I think you do some of that stuff. But you got to allow him to kind of just grow into the position, build a relationship with the guards next to him, um, and then, you know, working with Jalen on protections and fronts and recognition. So, that you know, I, I think he's ready to do that. I think he's watched Kelsey and – learned a great deal over the last two years. They just have a hole right now at right guard, and maybe that's Tyler Steen, and maybe it's not. And so uh, the draft might determine a lot of that right now. Um, but, you know, I think they're, I think they're in good shape here just going forward with the continuity that they have. And, look, Kelsey will be missed for sure, but everybody has to move on from, you know, Hall of Fame players. You just have sure. to move on. So if it is in, indeed that they go with a, an offensive lineman at 22, there's, there's this stacked tackle class. You know, we'll, we expect that Alt and, and Fashanu uh, are going to be out of the picture, but you've got Fatanu from Washington. You've got the guy from Fuaga from Oregon State. You've got uh, Amarius Mims. You've got Tyler Guyton. Is there anybody in that group who, who sort of screams Jeff Stoutland guy to you? Well, Fuanga is, um, he's been right tackle at Oregon State. You're wearing um, the colors. Yeah. I just, I actually was just watching him this morning. I mean, he's got, he's got anvil. Like his hands are like anvils. When he hits you, he shocks you. Um, like I think he's just beginning the process. I mean, he was a fine right tackle. Um, but when you watch him, um, he's got some nastiness to him. He moves really well. There's a lot to like. Tyler Guyton, I just got done watching another game against Texas. Like, honestly, some things just look so easy to him. But he's he needs a lot of work. Like, he's he doesn't really know how to – I mean, he's six foot eight now. He's, yeah, he's got to get lower. He's got to play lower. But if you just look at his natural movement, I mean, when this is all said and done, three years down the road, he might be the best of all of them, of everybody. I mean, including all in Fashano. Like, he's, he's really talented. And I've talked to Lane about him. He's worked out with him in Oklahoma. And, you know, he's just this really elite, smooth athlete. Sometimes that tra- – sometimes, Bo, that does transfer to become an elite player. And sometimes you're just this really smooth athlete that doesn't get a lot better. I mean, it's really up to him and to the coaching. But there's no question in my mind he can play left tackle. He can play right tackle um, because he's really good. And Marius is just a freak – like size, um, he's just played very little football. You talk about the snap, you know, the starts, it's limited eight starts, but he played a lot of football. They just rotate players at Georgia. Uh, and so he was part of these rotations. But just from a size standpoint, um, you, you know, you, he, he, he looks the part. I mean, you go through the airport and you're like, oh, man, this is a nasty and scary looking team. So if we take a step back and, and talk a little bit about some of the things the Eagles did in free agency, you talked about, you know, if they had leaned on the running game down the stretch, things might have been different. Well, they go out and spend a lot of money to bring in Saquon Barkley. What, what did you make of it all? Well, I mean, I thought the Giants, you know, screwed things up last year, Bo. Like, I, I didn't understand how they extended Daniel and put Saquon on the franchise. Which, yes, they made the wrong choice there. They made the wrong choice there. Like, they can cover it up any way they want. They made the wrong choice, and now they're stuck. So I, I would think that Saquon, just against the Giants, might be in the Pro Bowl this coming season. Just seeing him twice. Yeah. Like, I think he's just going to see, like, red, you know, and just rip Like, you thought, you thought Boston Scott was bad, Giants fans. Wait till you see Saquon. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's – I mean, when that schedule comes out next month, I mean, 
those games would be circled by Saquon right away. Like Saquon is an interesting back because he doesn't, he's not a guy that makes people miss. And he's not a guy that just has this, you know, contact balance and runs people over. He doesn't, but if you give him a runway, like he go a long ways and he could take, you give him a crease the way I think the, this would be the best offense line he's ever played behind. I mean, you give him a crease now. I mean, he, and, and a steady crease where it's not just this traffic jam on, the, you know, the Garden State Parkway, um, like it was to the Giants the last, you know, many of the last couple of years. Like he can go a long ways and you can move him around. He, he's a very good receiver, just to the ball really well in the air. He can run a lot of different type of routes. He can run the wheels and everything. So like there's a lot of really multiple ways that you can use Saquon, but I expect that this whole you know running back by committee thing is over. He's your starting running back. Maybe Gamewell's the backup, whatever. But like he's there, he's going to get 300 touches. And I think he's going to put up, you know, 15, 1800 yards. I expect that from Saquon this year. Uh, I think I'm with you. That's just rushing. Yeah, sure. Um, other side of the ball, you're also in addition to the Eagles, you're you're very close to that Jets team. And so this like trade by proxy that the Eagles have made of letting Hassan Reddick go, bringing in Bryce Huff, what is that going to do for for the defense? What kind of player are they getting? Well, I mean, look, Bryce Huff, the difference is Hassan is a full-time player. Like, he plays 75% of the snaps. Bryce has never done it. He's been a rotational player. Hey, it's third and 12, Bryce Huff time. And so I like Bryce Huff. I nicknamed him the Bugatti. He, like, he's a, an expensive Italian sports car. I like you that. Know? And, um, you take it out for a drive and, you know, you – you feel different than, and so he, he comes You need to explain end. it to me because I have never driven a Bugatti. I haven't either, but okay. I, I understand that this is a special type of drive. Like, I, like he's bigger than Hassan, um, and I've always said, just studying him in New York, especially the last two years, that he should get more playing time, but they had a lot of depth at that position, so he rotated. So maybe he plays himself into more snaps. Instead of 48% of the snaps, maybe he plays 60%. And if he does, or 65%, if he does, let's see how he holds up because he's never had to do that before. Um, and let's just see how he plays against the run if he's out on the field on first downs, which he wasn't in New York. But so from that standpoint, like Hassan is a better player because you know Hassan can affect the game in a lot of different ways. We got to see that about Bryce. I think the Jets got the better of the deal, but Bryce is younger. He's coming off his best season. Um Let's put him in there next to Jalen Carter and, and see, you know, what he becomes. And if they decide to start him or if they continue playing him in a rotational role. But if you, if you shut up 51 you know, million shekels, yeah. uh, you know, you'd think that he's going to be more than a part-time player. Yeah, and so do you think that really was just the circumstance of how deep the Jets were? Or do you think there are real concerns about him as a, as a run defender? I think it's both. I think it's both. I mean, Jermaine Johnson really grew into his role second year as the number one draft pick. They had signed Carl Lawson to a big, big number. They had Jonathan Franklin Myers who could play on the edge. So they had guys that could play out there. And they were a, a team built around their defensive front, much like the Eagles, the 49ers, a few other teams in this league, where they put a lot of resources into the defensive line. And so they were eight or nine deep. They, there were some Sundays last year the Jets drafted or addressed nine defensive linemen. And they just had this rotation. So that's that he had his role within that rotation. And they were really, really good. Um, they just realized by December that you can't win games if you don't score any points. They didn't score any points. So the defense kind of fell apart at the end of the season. What about bringing Chauncey Gardner-Johnson back? Uh, you know, we've heard so much about the the attitude he brings. What about just what he brings on the field? Well, I mean, he's a, uh, you know, it, it, they, they, Jonathan Gannon really used him in a great way. He took over for Malcolm Jenkins here, and he was great in that Malcolm Jenkins role. He was really nasty down the box. He's a very good tackler. He's got a lot of savviness, you know, down the box. But he also, you know, reads, reads, uh, you know, routes and the quarterbacks really well. And that's how he came up with the six interceptions. Uh, he got injured last year in Detroit. wasn't much of a factor, but I think he. I don't think, like, I never really understood even last year how you decided to part ways with Chauncey, but keep Bradbury. Like I, to me, like they didn't get it right last year and Chauncey should have been the guy they kept and they should have moved on, but they did it the other way and now he's back. So I think they recognize the mistake that they made last year. 
Anything else in terms of uh, at 22 guys who are who may be on your radar as we are all trying to cram for this this exam that is approaching? Well, I mean, I know that you know there's some elite defensive line prospects in this draft. You know, I mean, Dallas Turner is an elite player. Jared Verse is a, is an elite player. Edrick Cooper. If you just watch his Alabama game, you go, you know, he's Hassan Reddick. You know, um, that's how he moves. Maybe even quicker. Uh, there's some elite defensive tackles. I mean, you know, Johnny Newton is an elite player. Now you could say you're you're set with Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter and uh Tui Polo too, but be honest with and Milton Williams, but um Jordan Davis hadn't showed me a lot so far. I don't know who he showed anything to so far. Like I know how big he is and we'll talk about his weight, you know, when we get to mini camp and all this. He's been a non factor. And so at some point you go, what is Jordan Davis? And if he isn't what you need to see, which is somebody that can really affect a quarterback, uh, Johnny Newton at 22, like, I'm not saying it's a mistake with Jordan Davis because I'm, I'm not ready to do that. I want to see him with a different defense line coach and, you know, different, a, a different coordinator right now. But, you know, Johnny Newton is an excellent, excellent football player. So there's, there's 22, there's offensive lineman, uh, Graham Barton, at Duke, you know, he's a guy that can play any position. Uh, you know, you might plug and play him at right guard. Um, and you, you're you going to get a really smart, talented player. We talked a little bit about Byron Murphy yesterday, too, from Texas. The, uh, if you're looking at defensive tackles, you like him as well? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I like I like Newton better than Murphy. But, the, you know, it, depending on who you talk to, it, it's one, two. But he's, you know, in Devondre Sweat was there, but he reminds me of Jordan Davis, like, Right. He's got massive size, but I'm not sure about this pass rush ability. But Murphy gives you a good pass rush, gives you a good pop in the middle. Uh, I don't think he's Jalen Carter talented, but he's he's a town he's a talented player, and he's he's a first round pick. He's a first round talent, and so it's just a question of where you're comfortable taking him. Um, I expect honestly Howie to move in this draft, whether it's up or down, because it's just who he is. And they, they could do that if they want to go after a star player or acquire more picks. Uh, I, I think I can see them going up and I can see them going down in this draft. I actually can't even see them staying at 22. Like, I, I, I feel like go after one of the elite prospects uh, up front, and that might be Fuaga, and just say he's our right guard. And down the road, maybe he takes over for Lane if that happens. Um, going up to get a guy like that or drop him back and, and, acquiring just more depth and more picks along the, the front and hopefully finding themselves a corner um, for the future. Yeah, I think that's right. The only the only thing that I uh, is making me think that they could stay at 22 is if they just want to tackle and there's all of those guys, one of them's going to be there. They That's the one position where I think if they're going to stick and pick, that's where it makes sense. Otherwise, I think you're right there. They're, Howie's proclivity is definitely to to move up and or down around around the board. Uh, last one. You think we're going to see Lane at WrestleMania this weekend? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Oh, yeah, he'll be over there. Yeah, Kelsey will be over there. Uh, it'll draw a big crowd. I mean, it's a big event. Yeah. And so big events. Um, big events just draw um, guys in the just the guys in the trenches. They want to go be a part of it. You know, splash around. Um, <clears throat> you know, go watch guys fly off the turnbuckle and go. Yeah. Could this be my second career? So I expect Lane. I saw him yesterday. I know he's in town, so uh, I expect him to be over there uh, at this weekend. Who is like? Is were you a wrestling guy growing up? Did you have a guy who was yours? I was a I was a Bret Hart guy growing up. Yeah. Well, I I, I remember when I played in Dallas. Like Devon Eriks used to work out at the gym I went to. Uh -huh. They had pro wrestlers back then, so I, I kind of go back to Hulk and you know Hulkamania and all that kind of stuff back then. But I I've always been attracted to it, uh, knowing just the level of athlete it takes even if you want to say it's fake, whatever they want to say, like they, it takes great athletes to do a lot of the things that they do. So I always had a deep respect and uh, you know, and honestly in this digital fo footprint world that we live in, nothing comes close to wrestling when it comes to just wrestling. I mean, soccer, MMA, football, nothing comes close to the attention that wrestlers get on social media. Except for Brian Baldinger, because you, well, your numbers are boffo. We know that, Baldy. 
thank you so much. What they want right here, Bo. That's all. <laughs> uh, thank you for taking the time. I, I look forward to talking again soon, Baldy, and that'll do it for this episode of the PHLY Eagles podcast. Back on Monday, we're going to have, I believe, Fran Duffy joining us in studio, so that'll be fun. Oh. Thanks to everybody for watching and listening. We'll talk to you later, and as always, we love you. Silly like the mayor. 